priests and healers, advisors and judges, lore masters and sages, druids fulfilled a number of roles in ancient Celtic society. Maybe this explains why they're often represented as a hybrid class in games, able to take on a variety of roles, although their base purpose is usually support, similar to the role their historical counterparts played in society. The vision we have of those druids is often that of elderly men with long beards gathered in a wooded grove and performing a ritual of some kind, usually in deference to some kind of nature spirit or deity. It's their attachment to forests and nature that grants druids their unique image in modern media and games, and while there is some truth to that portrayal, druids were more than just priests who liked to frolic in the woods. In this video, I'll talk about what we do know, or think we know about druids, who, according to one famous author, never had to pay taxes. Sounds great. Where can I sign up? That famous author was none other than the Roman statesman, general, and later dictator Gaius Julius Caesar, who wrote about the people he encountered and conquered during the 50s BC in his Commentary de Bello Gallico, or Commentaries on the Gallic War. Caesar wrote extensively about the tribes he found in Gaul proper, or modern-day France, as well as throughout other parts of Europe that were sometimes lumped under the label of Gaul. In particular, he devoted several paragraphs to the Druids, who, along with the nobility, comprised the two higher classes of Gallic society. We have to rely on the writings of Caesar and other authors, because the Druids themselves left no written records of their practices. Not because they were illiterate, which Caesar claims they weren't, but because memorizing their rituals and practices both kept their knowledge secret and strengthened their minds. And therein lies a little bit of a problem. Everything that's been written about Druids in ancient times was written by someone who wasn't a Druid, and usually by someone who was openly hostile to them. After all, Caesar wrote commentaries on the Gallic War, not commentaries on the Gallic peace. And Caesar himself was a master statesman and politician, so his descriptions may have embellished his now defeated foe to make his accomplishments seem that much more grandiose. Consider that in a passage describing a battle against a German tribe, he claimed to have put his army up against 430,000 enemies and not suffered a single casualty. Now you understand why writers like Lucian were skeptical of ancient travelogues. So just keep in mind that everything I say in this video might be completely false. All I can do is use the tools available to me, and I feel like I'm pretty good at identifying the most obvious BS. Like a website that claimed, with nothing to back it up, that Winston Churchill was a druid. If that was true, maybe he should have used a little of his healing magic to keep FDR alive until the end of the war. The word druid comes from the Proto-Indo-European root words deru, meaning tree or oak, and wid, meaning to see or to know. Thus, deru wid, or druid, means oak seer, or more generically, one who knows trees. Druids held their sacred rites in forests, which contributed to their concept of a kind of priest attuned to nature. Though, admittedly, there was a lot of forest in ancient Gaul and Britain, and nothing resembling the temples of Greece and Rome, so where else were they going to meet? The Druids of Gaul, according to Caesar, oversaw not only the religious needs of their communities, but also resolved legal disputes and had the power to brand someone a criminal, making that person a pariah in society. This kind of mediation could even apply to separate warring tribes, as the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus wrote in the 1st century BC, around the same time Caesar was rising to power. Such obedience is observed not only by their friends, but also their enemies. For instance, when two armies approach each other in battle with swords drawn and spears thrust forward, these men step forth between them and cause them to cease, as though having cast a spell over certain kinds of wild beasts. So how did one become a druid? According to Caesar, it took 20 years of instruction, whereby an inspiring druid would have to memorize all the proper rites and beliefs. As mentioned previously, druids left no written records of their practices. One of these beliefs is in the indestructibility of the human soul and reincarnation, or as Caesar put it, that souls do not become extinct but pass after death from one body to another. This might be why reincarnate has long been a spell exclusive to druids in Dungeons and Dragons. Another detail I can recall from old school D&D was the notion that there could only be a limited number of high level druids in existence, including 9 at level 12, 3 at level 13, and 1 at level 14. If you had enough experience points to reach one of those levels, you had to defeat one of the current druids of that level in combat to level up. This was unique among all classes in D&D. There was nothing forbidding multiple high-level fighters or wizards, for instance, and I wondered why it was the way it was. Thanks to Julius Caesar's writings, I think I finally know the answer, and it's because the druids themselves sometimes fought each other for leadership. 
Over all these druids one presides, who possesses supreme authority among them. Upon his death, if any individual among the rest is preeminent in dignity, he succeeds. But if there are many equal, the election is made by the suffrages of the druids. Sometimes they even contend for the presidency with arms. Gary Gygax himself has said that D&D's druids were based on Caesar's writings, so I guess that explains that. One duty of the druids that both Caesar and Diodorus agree upon is that of presiding over human sacrifices. Diodorus describes a simple stabbing as a means of sacrifice, and other writers reference drowning or hanging, but, surprise surprise, mighty Caesar takes things a step further. He described what we would now call a wicker man, a large wooden man-shaped cage that people were trapped inside of and then burned alive. There's some question as to whether that was true, or as some believe based on even earlier writings by the Greek writer Poseidonius, whose writings haven't survived to the modern day. Even the matter of whether the Gauls performed human sacrifices at all is still debated, and may have been inserted or embellished by the Greeks and Romans to highlight how barbaric these foreign peoples were. A little divination or diplomatic army stopping aside, Druids in Roman times were described as having realistic powers and duties. The Celts of Gaul and Britain were largely conquered or wiped out by the Romans, with Emperor Claudius making Druidism illegal throughout the Empire in 54 AD. Druids fade from the historical record for some time after that, re-emerging in the early Middle Ages in stories composed in Ireland and Wales by Christian writers over half a millennium after the last Druids were seen in the British Isles. So, as you might imagine, things at this point get a little weird and more than a little supernatural. In this way, the stories of medieval Druids resemble those of early bards, who emerged in the same time period and in the same place. In fact, Druids might be the precursors of bards as well as other medieval Irish officials, like the arbitrators known as Brihan, or the Fili, poets, seers, and historians, who were experts at remembering long genealogies. Remember, the Druids prided themselves on their excellent memories. Naturally, the Druids in those stories could work magic. Some of it was your basic divination or foresight, but they were also sometimes described as having greater powers. St. Patrick's mission to Christianize Ireland was impeded by Druids, who raised clouds and mist to block his progress and they could call upon fiercer storms to disrupt and slow down armies. One of the best descriptions of Druidic magic comes from P.W. Joyce's A Short History of Ireland, written in 1911, which portrays Druids as highly potent sorcerers. They were skilled in magic, indeed they figure more conspicuously as magicians than in any other capacity, and were believed to be possessed of tremendous preternatural powers. They wore a white magic tunic, and when working their spells they chanted an incantation. In some of the old historical romances, we find the issues of battle sometimes determined not so much by the valor of the combatants as by the magical powers of the druids attached to the armies. They could, as the legends tell, raise druidical clouds and mists and bring down showers of fire and blood. They could drive a man insane or into idiocy by flinging a magic wisp of straw in his face, and many other instances of this necromatic power could be cited. But the magical power you probably most associate with druids is shapeshifting. Changing other humans into animals is a relatively common kind of hostile magic practice in stories about wizards, witches, and even bards, but changing yourself is much more rare. And it's not something I could find being attributed to druids, either in historical sources like Caesar's or in the later and more fantastical texts of the Middle Ages. There is one related account, however, that might shed some light on the topic, written by Roman geographer Pomponius Mela in the 1st century AD. It concerns Gaulish priestesses called the Galazenae, who occupied an island off the coast of modern-day Brittany. The Isle of Senna belongs to a Gallic divinity and is famous for its oracle, whose priestesses, sanctified by their perpetual virginity, are reportedly nine in number. They call the priestesses Galazenae and think that because they have been endowed with unique powers, they stir up the seas and the winds by their magic charms, that they turn into whatever animals they want, that they cure what is incurable among other peoples, that they know and predict the future. Maybe these priestesses were simply lumped in with the other priests of Gaul, aka Druids, and lent their shapeshifting powers to the overall lore. Or maybe it was just another way to paint the ancient Celts as barbarous savages who not only lived among wild animals, but could even become them. At best, shapeshifting was very low on the list of a Druid's magic powers, which probably means it was one of those things that sounded good on paper and had just the slightest basis in the accounts, so game designers decided to run with it. Let's wrap things up by talking about a few more popular myths about Druids. Stonehenge was constructed thousands of years before the Druids became known in the British Isles, so it wasn't made by or for them, despite often being considered a holy site for Druids. What about mistletoe and its connection to Druids? 
That comes from Roman historian Pliny the Elder, who wrote in the first century AD that druids, quote, hold nothing more sacred than the mistletoe, and the oak trees it grows on. Like the human sacrifice narrative, that may have come from Poseidonius. Pliny may have also given us the popular notion of a druid looking like an old white bearded man, when in reality they tended to span all ages. If nothing else, Caesar's account of druids possibly fighting to reach the top rank makes more sense for men in their 30s than for men in their 60s. Modern druidism has no direct lineage to the ancient Celts and spans a wide range of belief practices, though they all adhere to the notion of reverence for nature and its spiritual qualities, with some taking an active role in conservation. One of those neo-druids was Gerald Gardner, who founded his own branch of witchcraft and who I talked about in my video on wands. Though only tangentially linked to its ancient roots, the modern revival of the druidism probably played an important role in cementing druids as a common class in today's games, while making them a central part of the lore in many a fantasy world. I hope this video has given you some ideas for how you'll want to play your next druid, whether you're going for wise advisor or natural healer, or maybe you're leaning more toward the showers of fire and blood described by P.W. Joyce. In either case, you should probably leave the human sacrifices to the bad guys. Thank you so much for watching this video about druids. If you liked it, please give it a like or leave a comment below, and feel free to subscribe if you want to learn more about the true history of common elements in fantasy gaming and media. Until next time, I hope you'll stay well and that your taxes will be as low as a druid's.